Some folks hate it when the preacher gets political. Some of you watching will think that this message is political, and right about now you are trying to decide whether to speed through this part and go to the hymn or keep listening. And some folks are saying, oh, goody. But what about when it isn't the preacher that brings up the politics? What if God or the Holy Spirit is bringing up the subject? Do you hate it just as much or maybe more? We really do struggle with and resist stories that hold up the mirror to our beliefs and our understanding of the world and people and relationships. And when we feel challenged or chastised or when the stories raise the anxiety level of those in the room and we're all left wondering who believes like I do and who doesn't. So with a little bit of squirming going on in all of us, let's proceed. The reading this morning is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It is a story that brings up race and gender identity. It's a story about people on the margins, who is in and who is out. So let's listen. This is Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Then the angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearers, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the Acts of the Apostles, with the arrival of the Holy Spirit, over and over again, we hear stories of ordinary people empowered to do extraordinary things. Individuals and the community are all bent on imitating the communitarian ethos of a man, Jesus, crucified by the Roman authorities at the request, insistence of temple leadership. Since we've suddenly jumped from Acts 4 to the middle of Acts 8, let me give you some background. First of all, this Philip is not the disciple Philip. The disciple was from Bethsaida, and this Philip is from Caesarea. This Philip is one of the seven deacons or table servers chosen by the apostles back in Acts chapter 6 to take over the daily distribution of food. Later on, in Acts 21, 
this Philip will become known as Philip the Evangelist, and we will learn he has four unmarried daughters who prophesy. But right now, Philip is only recognized as one of the seven, full of the spirit and wisdom. Just before the events of this story, he has been preaching the good news throughout Samaria, and many have come to believe in Jesus. And one other background item. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we heard Jesus' final words to his disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. By the time our story rolls around, they have been in all those places except one, the ends of the earth, wherever that is. The narrative is beginning to branch out, and that centrifugal movement will accelerate as soon as Acts chapter 9 begins. If you're wondering how far the church's witness might go and whom it might reach, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch answers very far and every kind of person. So don't be surprised. This is a rich story with so many details that deserve our attention or discussion. For now though, let's focus specifically on the Ethiopian court official and how his identity has theological significance for the larger Acts story. Scholarship has subjected this unnamed person and his body to a tremendous amount of scrutiny. People want to know exactly who he is and how he got to where he is in life. So it's interesting and fascinating, and I, I don't wanna just leave out some of, the, some of our questions and some of the information, so I'm gonna run through some of them briefly. And these are described uh, by Matt Skinner in his commentary at Working Preacher. Described as an Ethiopian, where is he from, and how did that affect how he contributes to the story and its symbolism? Well, judging from the queen's title, Candace, he probably hails from an area south of Egypt. The term used to describe him, Ethiopian, literally burnt face in Greek, indicates the, the dark skin color of his people but it also could have resonated with other Greco-Roman literature that speaks of Ethiopians as people who lived on the fringes of the inhabited world. Greco-Roman authors sometimes use the term when characterizing sub-Saharan Africans as residents of a totally different land, almost a parallel society. Some authors referred to that society with a romanticized respect while others viewed it as inferior. Both perspectives exhibited Greco-Roman xenophobia, but the point is that the appearance of an Ethiopian in Acts might well elicit thoughts of the ends of the earth from a Roman's limited outlook on the world. Another question. Identified repeatedly in the passage as a eunuch, did he become castrated by choice, through violence, or was he born that way? All of those options are possible, and none of them would have been unheard of. It appears that for him, castration was a condition of his position in the queen's court. I'm not sure the answer or the question matters much for interpreting the passage. Considering it, though, does accentuate another question concerning how his body might have elicited condescension or derision from his contemporaries. Another question, how would others have viewed him and his manhood as a eunuch? Eunuchs did not fit conventional notions of gender in the Roman world. They were simultaneously men and non-men, neither male nor female. Sexually impotent, they were powerless and thus often scorned according to Roman constructions of masculinity and virility. 
What kind of social standing does he have? Assuming the story is told from a Greco-Roman point of view, one might consider him as despised and lacking status because of his identity as a eunuch, even more so if he's enslaved. Yet Acts describes him as powerful. He's an official in charge of the queen's treasury. He's literate and wealthy enough to have an Isaiah scroll and use of a chariot. Is he a Jew or Gentile? He could be either. I think we should assume he's Jewish, however. There were and still are Jewish communities in Africa. Because Acts describes Cornelius and his household as the first Gentile converts, the narrative that happens in Acts 8, or excuse me, Acts 11, and we're in Acts 8, the narrative seems to indicate the court official is Jewish. And what was his experience like in Jerusalem? Acts does not say. Because of Deuteronomy 23.1, though, some assume that the eunuch would have been forbidden from doing in Jerusalem what Acts says he came to do, worship. But that would depend on where in the city he was and what kind of worship he came to perform. End of our questions and um, theologizing so much. This joyful convert does not conform to the rules set by standard boundaries. He is powerless, yet powerful, strange, yet impressive, ignorant, yet knowledgeable, and most profoundly, the eunuch recognizes that the good news Philip shares with him acknowledges his own worth and dignity. I believe that because it's he and not Philip who raises the topic of baptism. He simply sees water and on his own does the reasoning. Baptism is for him. Whatever Philip tells him about Jesus, the court official discerns on his own the fitting outcome for him. Inclusion, participation, belonging. The Ethiopian is not some portal to a foreign world, though. He holds a mirror up in front of us, the church, collectively. Whom do you see? Who is missing? And why? Dennis Smith, in The Storyteller's Companion to the Bible, expands the view of this story to include repercussions that Philip may have experienced. I want to read just a couple sections for you, for us. Philip, contrary to popular opinion, had not had an easy time of it. Ever since he got back from his excursion in the desert, he had been in trouble. Now he had been summoned to appear before the Christian caucus for political and moral purity. Somehow they had heard about his meeting with the Ethiopian eunuch. Comments about the Ethiopian from the caucus included, he's a foreigner. He is from the wrong race. He's from, he has the wrong sexual identity. His kind are not allowed in the company of the politically and morally pure. They all concluded, God does not allow it. But he can't help what he is. Doesn't God have some say in that, asked Philip? We and God are just like this, said the spokesman, raising his hand with two fingers pressed tightly together. We know what God likes, and we know he doesn't like these kinds of people. It was a strong argument, Philip had to admit. Before he met the eunuch from Ethiopia, he had agreed with all of them. God was a God of purity and a God of holiness. This is what he had always believed. It was the job of religious people to protect God from impurity. And the Ethiopian eunuch, he was about as impure as they come, and everybody knew that. The final question by the religious leaders awakened Philip from his musings about the events of that day. 
What do you have to say for yourself, they inquired. The answer came to him in a flash. The Spirit made me do it. May the Holy Spirit continue to lead us, lead us to the ends of the earth, to the margins and the marginalized, to persons of every ability and disability, to persons of every skin color and gender identity. May the Holy Spirit lead us to come alongside and to share Jesus, to share life together. Let's pray. Oh God, I thank you for these moments of learning and hearing stories and having our eyes opened to the mirror held up in front of us by the Ethiopian eunuch in our story. How we're challenged, how we are um, chastised, how we are um, embraced still by the Holy Spirit. And it truly is my prayer and deepest hope and longing for all of us that your spirit would indeed lead us to what we may experience as the ends of the earth, to those that we least uh, want to engage or encounter or have to interact with, those that we fear. But God, your your spirit, your love encompasses all and includes all. So I pray that you would encourage us, empower us, compel us. Move us alongside others to share Jesus and to share life. God, as your people gathered together in this time We join our voices together and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.